Welcome to today's webinar on Oklahoma rental rates. This webinar is part of our ongoing Learn at Lunch series. Today's speaker is Extension Specialist Roger Saws. Feel free to ask questions using the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. Roger will answer any questions at the end of this webinar. For more farm management information resources, you can visit the eFarm Management website, and I will paste the link to the site in the chat box below. So, Roger, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, Brent. I really appreciate the invitation to uh, talk about the uh, land rental markets uh, today. And uh, good afternoon to everyone that's listening out there. And uh, you're a real glutton for punishment because you can certainly be outside enjoying the sunshine. So I really appreciate uh, your willingness to uh, sit in and and uh, listen in on uh, what I have to say about the uh, the land tenure markets. But uh, Anyway, what I plan to do this afternoon is to show some uh, some slides that will explore the recent trends and patterns in those land tenure markets. Uh, it's a common topic that uh, those of us in production agriculture are asked about. Since not all producers can afford to own the land that they operate, and likewise some landlords prefer not to operate their farm, but they wish to earn, say, a, a desired return or a contribution to their living expenses or to their retirement income. Uh, you know, a, a lease agreement serves as a common ground in which those two parties, the landlord and tenant, meet. And of course, the goal is to come up with a fair and equitable agreement that is satisfactory to both, that both can hang their hat on. So I hope to pass on uh, some information for you today that will serve as a beginning point for discussion and negotiation. Researching cash rents and uh, crop shares provide a needed background of what's going on in the farm economy and how that translates into the ability to pay for rentals. Even though reported rates and terms are a good place to start, they should only be used as guides. Our quoted rates as well as those from NAS are not necessarily right for your particular piece of uh, land. There's a lot of personalized information and it needs to be factored into every nego uh, negotiation and uh, those discussions. For example, you, have, uh, you may have some differences in land quality or improvements or restrictions on that land usage that can greatly impact the value of those potential leases. So in other words, it's really important to discuss and flush out the details. Of those um, of those topics, so how did we come up of, with our reported rates that uh, we provide in our uh, extension publications? Well, I thought I would uh, give you a brief rundown as to those survey procedures, and it started last fall. The Oklahoma Field Office for USDA NAS sent out a statewide survey, and they asked all sorts of questions as to crop shares and cash rentals for cropland and pasture. They sent it out to their mailing list, which uh, is a pretty good representation of uh, production agriculture around the state. We got a number of surveys back. About 175 were good for the cropland uh, publication, over 400 for the pasture. Uh, the results are reported in uh, those current reports listed here. 216, which is on the pasture side, and uh, current report 230, which is on the uh, cropland rental rate uh, aspect. These uh, publications are available online. They are mobile friendly on your smartphone, but also if you would like to print out a nice, uh, you know, neat copy, a hard copy for reference, uh, they are also available in PDF format. So check them out. We do update these every other year. Uh, we alternate uh, these publications with our custom rate report. So uh, let's go into the, the cropland rentals. Uh, and I've got it for wheat. Uh, this is in our uh, publication. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough responses or observations to really hang my hat, uh, at least from a statistical standpoint, for some of the other crops that are you know, grown around the state, say soybeans or corn or grain sorghum even cotton. I do have it obviously for wheat. Uh, that's the most uh, predominant crop in the state. Uh, has the highest acreage. Uh, you can see that it is down somewhat, at least according to our report, um, as 
compare it to uh, two years ago. We have the average, we have the median also listed there. Median is a sort of a dispersal or dispersion uh, of the observations about that midpoint. And then of course we have those averages from two years ago. The dry land cash rents for wheat ground appear to have declined. And uh, like I mentioned before, rental rates tend to be a reflection of the farm economy how well the crop sector has performed and is expected to perform does carry a lot of weight on the ag real estate market and those resulting rentals. So you may be asking, you know, especially those that aren't familiar with production agriculture in, in Oklahoma, what's driving uh, some of these corrections or adjustments in the rental markets, at least, uh, you know, uh, amongst those uh, individuals that are growing wheat uh, and those uh, uh, cash rentals? Well, it really boils down to where we're at in the uh, commodity uh, markets. And so we've experienced uh, some low commodity prices over the past several years, and uh, it's had an impact on those farm finances. You know, you look at the wheat prices over the past several years, we've seen a major drop off from the first part of this decade. You know, with that kind of decline, you know, returns and operating margins are pretty marginal with a lot of these, uh, you know, wheat uh, uh, farmers uh, around the state, even with average yields. Now, you know, you can really hope for higher than average yields. Hopefully we'll see that this year. But, you know, uh, we unfortunately won't see those higher than average yields every year. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a good way to spread out those, uh, those costs and lower your break-evens. But uh, with average yields, uh, it's a pretty tough go when you have uh, wheat prices uh, between 4 and $5. And so it's really not surprising that rentals have had to make a downwards adjustment and correction. You know, the budgeting process, uh, you know, with our enterprise budgets or, you know, at least if you can pencil out uh, on your own, uh, it, it really does show you what a you know the the tenant can afford to pay, and many just can't pencil out quite as much as what they did a couple years ago, and so really where we go to from here depends on those expectations by you know both parties concerning profit margins. You know five dollar wheat is certainly better than three or four dollar wheat, but it's still hard to be optimistic about wheat some of the other small grains as well as the feed grains because there's just a lot of it worldwide. Uh, we, you know, and, and with that situation in mind, a continued weakness in the crop sector will weigh on the cropland, uh, cropland rentals going forward in many areas of the state. Also, NAS does conduct their own survey on an annual basis and with that kind of uh, report, we can see how the cash rents in Oklahoma do compare to other states, uh, at least in the lower 48. Gives us a pretty good perspective on, you know, comparisons around the country. And you, of course, you can see, you know, Oklahoma is sort of a low man on the totem pole, uh, so to speak, because we just don't have the productivity, the rainfall. The intensity of, uh, of the, the crop growing regions that we see further north and east of us in those corn and uh, soybean growing areas. And of course, uh, we just don't have the yields that other areas of the country do experience. And so, uh, you know, those cash rentals are a reflection of that. Also, NAS uh, does break, oh, excuse me, let's go back. NAS does go back. Um, and boils down uh, those statewide numbers into a sort of a countywide basis. And this is looking at uh, those numbers all the way down to a county level. Now, this is a composite for cropland, uh, not only the statewide averages, but even down to the, to the, uh, the county level. But it gives you a pretty good feel and flavor of where, you know, those rentals are highest around the state. The link is shown down below. Uh, they conduct this survey, or at least they provide this, uh, these, uh, these numbers every other year. Um, and so I have the 2017 numbers here. 
Uh, the next update will be uh, released later on this fall. But uh, you can see that the rents are highest in the most productive uh, cropland growing regions uh, in the state, north central Oklahoma, some of the other counties where crops are important, uh, west of uh, Oklahoma City along uh, I-40. Of course, location is always very important in uh, agricultural real estate. And, uh, and of course, you can see uh, those uh, areas close to urban areas uh, also where cropland might be at a premium. Before I move on to the pasture side of those cash rentals, I wanted to spend a few moments on cropland share lease arrangements. Uh, current report 230 looks at those uh, crop share terms in more detail than what I'm showing here. But this is just a brief overview of what's typical and what's fairly representative around the state. You know, in a crop share lease, the, uh, the landlord shares a portion of the production risk expense and return with the operator, with the tenant, in which certain costs are often shared in the same proportion that uh, production is, is shared. And so in a crop uh, share lease uh, arrangement, at least statewide, our reports show that, you know, the tenant on average receives about two-thirds of the crop uh, while paying that or more of the fertilizer, pesticide, and the cost of their application. Those particular inputs are seen as uh, yield increasing inputs uh, and in principle they should be shared in the same percentage as the crop is shared. To not do so uh, does encourage a less than optimal use of that input. So for example, if you have a tenant that provides and, and shells out all the costs for fertilizer, receives only half or two thirds of the crop, they're incurring all of the costs but only receiving partial benefit for that expense. Also, you can see that the, the tenant pays nearly all of the seed cost, uh, also pays nearly all of the harvesting cost, and because lime and that application does have some multi-year benefits, the landlord may share in all the cost or uh, they may share, share in the cost or they may pay all of the cost, especially if that uh, lease is annual in nature. So let's move along to the, the pasture side of the equation on those uh, cash rental rates. And in contrast to cropland, you know, perennial pasture rentals have uh, held their own pretty well over the past two years, at least according to our report. Uh, in fact, they appear to have shown at least some modest gains over the past two years, despite some tight operating margins in the cow calf sector. You know, forage base gains do have some added value, especially as the productivity of the forage base grows as one travels east across the state. So you can see as you travel from west to east that those rentals tend to increase. Pasture rents have been supported by the continued expansion of the beef cattle herd in Oklahoma, although that herd growth has slowed in recent years. You know, cattle prices have been pretty pretty good, pretty resilient, despite the fact that we've had some increased beef supplies from that larger cattle inventory. And I think that we can, you know, hang our hat based on the export uh, markets. And, uh, and, uh, and so we've, uh, you know, benefited from that fact. And hopefully those exports will continue. So, you know, in regards to the native uh, pasture and those uh, regions of the state, we've seen some modest gains. Uh, but even with uh, your improved or introduced forages like Bermuda grass or it could be fescue or uh, some blue stem varieties, I think that they have at least held their own, maybe some modest gains uh, there also. So where we go to from here on the pasture line side really boils down to several factors. Uh, one of which uh, could be the feed supplies, uh, pasture conditions, water availability, all of which are really in good shape at this point in time. But also I think it boils down to the performance of the livestock industry, especially the cattle economy in Oklahoma and those resulting earnings. And at least according to the LMIC, it looks like the cow calf sector might be uh, returns from the cow calf sector might be a bit higher than what it was uh, last year. And if that is indeed the case, I think that that will provide some uh, continued support 
and stability to those pasture rentals going forward. Also, you can see how uh, our pasture rentals compared to other areas of the state uh, of the country. And uh, as you might expect, our pasture rentals aren't quite as high as uh, some of the other areas, especially to our north and east, that have uh, higher productivity and higher stocking rates. And then when you boil down the Oklahoma numbers, statewide numbers, down to the, uh, the county level, it's really a uh, no surprise here, I think, to most of you. It does follow a familiar pattern, you know, higher rents in the east, uh, lower out west, there are some urban influences around Oklahoma uh, City, especially along that, I would say, US 81, I-35 corridor, where there might be a rel relative scarcity of pasture ground to rent, but there's probably uh, some recreational interests that are also influencing the markets uh, uh, at, in those locations. And then I think it's really useful for us to look at the relationships of the rental markets and the uh, land transfer or ownership transfer markets uh, with those land values. And so I wanted to look at a, uh, a time frame of looking at those relationships going back to at least 1970. And so we have a land value scale on the left that starts at about $250 for cropland. That's back in 1970, and now it's uh, approximately 1800 at least according to NAS. The cash rent scale is on the right, and it starts at about $10 in 1970, and now it's about $32. So land values have shot up about sevenfold, rental rates up uh, threefold, you know, and, and since about 2000, the turn of the century, Cropland prices have really picked up. Uh, they may not have quadrupled or even more than that, like in other states, but they have tripled. Uh, but rents, on the other hand, they haven't increased quite as much. Uh, they've gone from 26 to $32, and that's only a 23% increase. And so then we look at it from the standpoint of uh, the pasture values and those rental rates, according to NAS. Uh, we see a lot of the same patterns going on here, but I think it's even more pronounced when we see that uh, you know land values since 1970, as shown by the red line, have increased rather dramatically, nearly 1,000% 1, since 1970, while rents have almost tripled. You know, for the first 20 years of my career at OSU, starting in the mid 1980s. Uh, I could pencil in nine or ten dollar pasture rentals for native grass, and that would be good to go for quite a while. Uh, but you know, since 2000, pasture land values have more than tripled, uh, while rents have increased uh, less than really 100%. Uh, they've gone from eight to about 13 and a half dollars, I believe, per acre. So you can ask yourself, what's really going on here? You know, we we see these relationships of they're, they're both increasing, they're both appreciating, but, uh, but at different rates. Well, ca you know, cash rents are believed to be a good indicator of current ag returns, while the market value of ag real estate and those land markets are influenced by not only earnings and, and expected earnings, but also by some other non-farm factors. And so we can see those dynamics that come into play with the gross rent-to-value comparisons uh, with cropland and pasture ground looking at that same time frame and we're just dividing one variable uh, over another uh, and so we're dividing the rents by the underlying land values and it's really important to see that comparison and it's, and it's important to understand that relationship as these relations or excuse me these ratios provide a benchmark of basic earnings associated with land utilization and the general relationship of those rental earnings to current market values. The gross rent to value ratio connects the ownership transfer market with the rental market. And so, as I mentioned before, income expectations do have a major influence on farmland values. There's really no denying that that will continue to happen. But I also contend that there are other factors that are influencing 
I would say the the minds and the prospective buyers out there in these uh, land markets, especially in production ag, and uh, and those factors have, I think, influenced uh, those those levels uh, even more as we have uh, progressed throughout the years. Uh, for you know, so for instance, we have other factors uh, such as rural lifestyle settings or recreational interest or we have more off-farm income on behalf of these operators and and the buyers that are are out there so you know for instance on on the uh, the pasture side we have a lot of these 40 to 80 acre pasture land tracks that are east of i-35 run a few mama cows or a few horses out there they're being operated and run by some part-time operators with a considerable amount of off-farm income. And so these tracks are valued at hundreds of dollars more than larger tracks owned by a, say, an active farmer and rancher for their commercial operations that are really trying to drive their livelihood from that land itself. And so while the ratios are important for measuring the relative profitability of land, there are many reasons why a buyer might be willing to bid land upwards beyond what a conventional cash return may suggest is economically rational. And, and so some buyers are purchasing land for other reasons than trying to make a livelihood from a piece of ground. And so I think uh, this chart uh, does demonstrate some of those other non farm or off-farm factors uh, or urban interests that are influencing the markets, especially uh, on the uh, ownership transfer side. So I think it's important to understand some of those relationships. And, uh, and it's also really important to understand sort of, uh, you know, the, the whys and wheres of uh, the land rental markets uh, to have that background and to provide you know our clientele that walk in through the door or give us a call you know what are the going uh, rental rates out there and uh, why is this occurring and what can I do to improve my particular uh, lease agreement and so I think we've got some excellent resources out there on the World Wide Web one of uh, which is at the OSU Ag Land Lease website at aglease.info and also the North Central Farm Management Committee uh, website at aglease101.org. They contain a wealth of uh, farm management uh, spreadsheet tools, lease information and forms, rental rates and land value resources, and legal and tax considerations. And so I think it's important for us to have that background, but in case uh, we have clientele that walk in, uh, we can provide them more information should they need it. Also, I want to remind the listeners out there that I will be updating the Ag Land Value website uh, at our Ag Econ Extension um, site here at uh, OSU. And I'll be updating this in the next uh, couple weeks to come. And so I'll keep you posted when that's ready to uh, be released with the 2018 numbers. And we'll have a chance to see where we're at in the uh, real estate markets here in Oklahoma when it, uh, when it uh, uh, concerns production agriculture. It's always an interesting uh, bit of information to pass along and uh, undoubtedly we'll have another webinar uh, in the next couple months on this particular topic, so stay tuned. So I guess we're at the end of today's uh, particular uh, segment. I really appreciate all of you for tuning in uh, during the lunch hour. And uh, hopefully this gave you a little bit of a background as to where we're at in the uh, land tenure markets, uh, where we've been, where we're at, where, where we might be headed, and also some useful sources of information. Uh, Brent also reminded me to, re uh, to remind you that uh, we would like to have your feedback. Uh, and uh, so please go to that link below to fill out that short survey and let us know how we can make a good product even better with our uh, with our educational efforts and outreach and and I think uh, Brent does a wonderful job with these webinars and so 
give us your feedback. Let us know, you know, how we're doing, and uh, we'll take it forward and and uh, improve on that. So, once again, thank you so much for listening in today. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I'll pass it back to Brent. Thank you, Roger, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We will have our next webinar in April over farm transition planning and succession planning with uh, Shannon Farrell presenting. And it'll be on a date to be decided. I'll let everyone know once that date is finalized. Thank you again for filling out our webinar survey. It does help us with that feedback. And with that, I'll see you in April. Thank you.